Father, we do just lift up this time and pray, God, that you would move mightily. Lord, as we just continue studying your word and, and uh, Lord, as we get into this area that talks about your work in our lives, not just in saving us, but empowering us and directing us and guiding us and bringing us to maturity, I pray, I pray that we would hear and we would be people who don't shut down because maybe we've had bad experiences or seen bad things, but Lord, we would trust you. So I do pray as we study this and the next, probably the next couple months as we look at this, that it would be empowering for us. It would be freeing for us. And we would be people who understand that God, you're not done with us. And Lord, you want to work in us, you wanna grow us up, and you wanna, Lord, you wanna use us in our church and in our community. So we just give you this time, we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I know that we always call the building the church, right? I, I get that because it's just a habit, but we are the church. A church isn't a building. The church is not an organization. It's not a, you know, a place where you come and gather together like a club. The church is an organism, and it's growing and moving and changing, and the way you get into the church is by being born again. Right? You're born again, you're part of this thing, and we're all growing and changing together. We're doing this thing together, and that's the important thing. And so Paul and sees writing to the church at Corinth, they seem to have lost track of that. Even in the stuff we've looked at, they've, they've got off base, they're starting to go you know, in their own direction. And here's the sad thing, they're trying to do in the flesh what God gave them in the spirit. And that's something we do. We see something, we hear something, and even sometimes we try and emulate some things that are not so good to emulate. And I think especially today in our generation, there's stuff going on because we have this thing called YouTube, right? And we go watch something and we go, well, that's really awesome. I wanna do that. Well, you know what? It might be awesome, it might not be awesome. I'm not gonna judge that, but listen, you can't, you can't just duplicate something and you can't just work it up. It's a work of God in our lives. And oftentimes, I see the biggest failure, I think, in churches are people trying to do things in the flesh. Whether it's, you know, just serving or even in a degree of trying to make, you know, make it look like the Holy Spirit is doing something. I believe the Holy Spirit's alive today. I believe the Holy Spirit is working today. And I believe he wants to do great things in our lives. But we can't just work that up. We can't make that happen in the flesh. And I believe that's what was going on in Corinth. And again, it's happening you know, around us. And, and their problem was they were believing in the gifts of the Spirit, which I believe are for today. But they were trying to do them in the flesh. And I don't know about you guys, but I go through YouTube things and I see a lot of junk out there that is supposed to be the Holy Spirit. And we've gotta be careful and just listen, but I wanna say this, just because things are abused don't mean that we need to reject the Holy Spirit. And I think that's kind of what happens. You see some abuses and some weirdness and some things and so all of a sudden we go, stay away from me, I don't want any part of that. And that's not good. So there's gotta be some kind of balance we come to. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 is all about. And we're gonna spend some time developing this, looking at this, and hopefully we'll come to the place where we're gonna be people who we want the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We want him to have his way with us. So Paul, again, writing to this church and letting them know, you guys quit abusing this and let him have his way. Amen. I gotta say, man, I watched something today that just kinda came up, and as I was studying this, I, I watched something today. There's a guy, Michael Todd, the Transformation Church. Do not watch that. That's so bad. And so demonic, and yet, here's what people go. Well, man, did you see this spirit move? Yeah, I saw a spirit move. I don't believe it was the Holy Spirit. 
And so, listen, we got to watch out for that because people get wrapped up in that and get caught up, and there's a lot of stuff going on in our generation, and especially around us, Bethel Church is doing stuff in the Spirit that are not from the Holy Spirit. And we got to be people that we don't want to emulate the bad things. Let's look at the good things. And let's look at God's word. So, verse one, Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, a couple things. Verse one, we gotta pay attention to a couple things. Number one, in your Bible, the word gifts is in italics, at least in my Bible it is, because that's not in the original language. So here's what Paul's saying. Now concerning spirituals, or the spirit, right? So he's not writing just about gifts, although that's gonna come up, but he's writing about the spirit moving. And I know for some of us, we hear the word Holy Spirit, and we start freaking out, because we've seen abuses, we've seen things go on, and that's not good. The Holy Spirit is part of what we call the Godhead, the Trinity. He is God, and he's still working. He didn't give up. He didn't quit, he didn't roll over after the first century, some would like us to think that, but he's still working and still moving, and so listen, first of all, we notice that. He talks about, so he's gonna talk about spiritual things, but then also, notice what he says, brethren. Paul's upset with this church, but it doesn't mean there's not the church anymore. They're still the church, they're still the brethren. And we need to remember that. Sometimes we have disagreements with each other, which is not good, right? We're supposed to work those things out. But sometimes we have disagreements or don't like what another fellowship is doing or somebody else, and we, we don't want to let them be the church. We go, no, they're not good. Just because people don't do everything the way we do it doesn't mean they're not the church, and so Paul's saying, listen, you guys are still brethren, even though you're messed up and you're messing this up big time and you're totally in the flesh, you're still brethren. They're still part of the church. And then he makes this statement, I do not want you to be ignorant. Here's what blows my mind. Paul says this three times in three different places that he doesn't want us to be ignorant. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, he says, now concerning Israel, I do not want you to be ignorant. What is one of the things the church fights about? Israel, and whether Israel should exist today. And, and you know, it cracks me up. The things that Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, are the things we're the ignorantest of. <laughs> right? We just like, I'm thinking, he goes, I don't want you to be ignorant about Israel. And we want to pick and fight and we want to have these things. Shouldn't we come to some kind of agreement? And then here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, what does he say about spiritual? Don't be ignorant about the spirit. I don't want you to be. What should that tell us? We should be people then. We want to study this. We want to understand it. And we want to get it together in our lives. Why? Because he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. So I should find out everything I can find out biblically about this so that I can walk in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So there again, what is one of the things the church fights about probably more than anything else? The gifts of the Spirit. How does the Spirit work? What is he doing? What is he not doing? What is he allowed to do? It always cracks me up. Some people go, he can't do that. He's God. Who are we to tell him? back off, right? He's God. And so, listen, we fight about that. And then, oh, the next one, the next one is one that obviously we fight about. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13, he says, I do, about the second coming of Jesus, I do not want you to be ignorant. And we are so ignorant, right? It, it, amazes, it amazes me, the three things that Paul definitely says, don't be ignorant about, we're just the opposite. We're way ignorant about. And we need not to be. Listen, if God is telling us we shouldn't be ignorant, what that tells me is there's information in his word that can straighten everything out. I gotta get biblical. We need to be people who are biblical, not, you know, listen, I think theology's great and studying theology's great, 
but our theology has to come out of the Bible. And so Paul is here telling us, I don't want you to be ignorant about the Spirit. And so here's my prayer. I don't want us to be ignorant about the Spirit. So let's walk through this. Let's walk through this together. Let's figure out what Paul's saying. Let's figure out what the Word of God says about the work of the Spirit in the church. And then here's the most important. Let's believe him. Let's say, okay, if this, is, if this is your word, God, we're going to believe your word and we're gonna allow your word to rule and reign in our hearts. So that's what Paul says. So, so that's a lot just to start this, right? So we're getting started on this. Paul tells us this is what we need to do. So let's don't misuse things. Let's don't abuse things. Something that I learned a long time ago the gifts of the Spirit, the working of the Spirit that, that he does in our lives, those gifts are tools, not toys or trophies. They're tools that God has given us to build the body and to build the church. And when we understand that and we don't get so freaked out about it, you get a little bit more relaxed, you take a little bit of a breath, and you go, okay, have your way in my life and you yield yourself to him. And so, listen, we need, to, we need to walk in that way. So, first of all, he reminds the Corinthians of something. In verse two, he says, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. So, you know, here's the thing. These guys, these guys came out of something, and the world that they came out of, the Greek world they came out of, was full of all kinds of mysticism and, you know, antics and things going on, people chanting, people doing things. And he says, hey, you were led away, and I like this, by dumb idols. You were following things that could not do anything for you, but you were following them, and people chanted. And here's the thing, people got real excited. As a matter of fact, they got ecstatic. They started, they started uttering things. They started doing things. And it all sounded, you know, hey, you were involved in that. Saints, we don't take that into the church. And sad to say, a lot of the church is doing this today. And so there's some abuses going on. And he says, listen, I know you were caught up in that. I know that influenced your life. And now you've got to take that and you've got to, listen, you've got to try and get that out of your life just because somebody has some kind of ecstatic utterance, whether it's understandable or not, doesn't mean it's right. Are you with me? Hey, that thing by Michael Todd. This is pretty exciting. Don't watch it. This is pretty exciting, but doesn't mean it was right. It was totally wrong. And the thing in the church today that I'm watching is there's a lot of hype going on. And all of this hype that's going on isn't, it's not necessarily bad, but it's surely not necessarily good. Just because someone's exciting and because there's hype behind it and because there's a lot of drama with it and there's a lot of enthusiasm and, and stuff going on, doesn't mean it's right. And here's what Paul's saying, that's what you came out of. Some of us came out of a world like that. Maybe some of us kind of came out of some entertainment things and things going on. We need to know, listen, we need to say, not drag that in and say, oh, God, God's going to sanctify it. He may or he may not. But let's be people of the word. Amen. And he's saying, hey, church at Corinth, you guys are doing this so wrong. Don't you remember what you were brought out of? Don't you remember what was going on? And that stuff was not from the Lord. That stuff was from dumb idols or demonic, right? That's what was happening to you. And why on earth are you wanting to repeat that? Now listen, I know sometimes in our lives, we move in a direction and something is, that's, you know, we kind of drag that in with us. And it's going to take a while to get it out of us. But we need to trust him. So again, just because somebody, oh, and then he uses, listen, then he gives us an illustration. He says, therefore, 
I make known to you in verse three that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. Now to me, that's weird. I don't think people in Corinth were doing that. I'm not sure, maybe, but I just don't think they were doing that. But here's the thing. Somebody doing it. And he says, just because, once again, just because there's enthusiasm and maybe even an ecstatic utterance doesn't mean it's right. And people were getting caught up in things. And hey, maybe it was, maybe it was some people that came out of Judaism and they're in this thing and they get all excited and they haven't fully converted. According to Galatians chapter three, anyone hung on a tree was accursed. And maybe they're in the midst of this excitement and hype going on. They're starting to shout that and chant that. Again, I think it's so dangerous when we start getting all hyped up. I think it's, I think it's good to be excited. I love to be excited. And I think it's good to be emotional with God. I believe he gave us emotions, right? And we should express them. We should be really, happy, really, really, really happy and sometimes really, really sad. Then now all of that's okay. That's not the bad thing. But the bad thing is when we look at what's going on and listen and not paying attention to what's being said. You hear what Paul's saying? Pay attention to what they're saying because you cannot by the Spirit, say Jesus is cursed. And pay attention to that. And my heart is, in our generation, when we click on those different YouTube clips and and little things, because, you know, God forbid if we sat still for more than 10 minutes. Sorry. But when we get on those little sound bites and do things, pay attention to what's said. Not just how it's presented, not just what's going on, but listen to what is being said. And that's what Paul's cautioning these guys. Again, I don't think anybody in the church at Corinth is going around, you know, let's say it's the Lord, Jesus is cursed. I don't, I don't think they're doing that. But he's saying people are doing that. So pay attention to that. And I think it's something we need to hear. Oh, and then he says... Just the opposite, right? And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, I know, I know, unbelievers will go, watch me. He's not talking about just uttering the words. He's talking about it being real in your heart. And the only way that happens, the only way that that comes out of your mouth with a sense of of, uh, uh, sincerity in your heart is by the Holy Spirit. You know, one day we may be someone who's cursing the Lord, not by the Spirit, and the next day we may be saying, Jesus is Lord, because we got born again. And so he's letting them know how important it is that we listen, and no inspired utterance is going to be cursing Jesus. But an inspired utterance may Say Jesus is Lord. Are, are, you, are you with us on that? And again, I think there's st- stuff creeping in the church. It's not just about the Spirit. It's other things. We've read all the way through this church. Is in, this is the most fleshy, messed up, funky church there ever was. If there was a bad church, this is it. This would be one of those churches, I think if I went to, I would be looking for another church. Right? I'd be thinking, man, Who planted this church? Paul. Oh, isn't that kind of crazy? Who stayed with this church for three years? Paul. Oh. Well, then this is a bunch of dense people because they didn't get what he was saying, right? So they're just messed up, and Paul is trying trying to direct them and guide them and get them back to that place. So now he's laid all that out, and he's saying, once again, What we do is done by the Spirit. Now, here's something I want us to pay attention to in the next three verses. Because I think this is something we misunderstand. Diversity builds unity. I'm not talking about what our world's calling diverse right now. I'm talking about we are not all the same and we don't all act the same and we don't all all do the same thing. Praise God, right? I'm glad we can look around and see people that don't look like us. Don't even, and 
Hey, we don't even all think the same, but that's what builds unity. A lot of people use the illustration of, you know, a football team. You could use anything. You could use a basketball team or a baseball team. Not every player on the field does the same exact thing, do they? But they're all together moving in one direction. And that's what we are. We're not all going to do the same exact thing, but we're together. So that diversity builds unity for us, and it's what makes us, what makes us unified. The sad thing, our world today will only accept unity when it's uniformity. They think unity means we all have to think the same, we all have to accept the same things, we all have to you know, act the same, have the same mindset, etc. That's not what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says, we're all gonna be different and we're all gonna do things differently. Even though the same Spirit's working in us, we're all gonna do it a little bit different. Why? Because we're individuals. God didn't make cookie cutter Christians, praise God, again, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I think you look at me and go, I don't want to be like that. Well, you know what? I don't want to be like you either. <laughs> right? So this is what's going on, and we have to understand that. And God made us different, and he made us individuals. And the thing that bothers me, again, going back to the YouTube thing, is there's a lot of people that watch a YouTube clip and then try and mimic that in their church. I remember years ago, and I'm not going to tell you, who it was, a friend of mine who's a pastor, had one of his younger pastors fill in for him. And the younger pastor copied a message from another pastor, from another church, like pervade him. I mean, he did everything exactly like the other guy did it. And the senior pastor came back and said, look, if I wanted so-and-so to come and teach, I would have asked them. But I wanted you to teach. And I want to use you. And keep that in mind. Because, hey, we can have, there's nothing wrong with having heroes. And there's nothing wrong with looking up to people and admiring people and, and understanding that. But you can't be them. I remember Chuck Smith saying how at one point he tried to be like Billy Graham. And he found out he wasn't Billy Graham. <laughs> hey, God used him, right? I mean, God used him mightily. But he's not Billy Graham. I remember Chuck talking about, it's funny, he was talking about, like, if you ever saw Chuck Smith teach, here's what he did. And he did not move for an hour, two hours, however long he was there. It was like this. And he said one time someone said, you got to move a little bit. So he started walking around kind of like I do. And he said he got way over here, and he forgot what he was going to say. And he goes, do you know how long of a walk it is back to the pulpit to try and find out what you're going to say? Now, I've learned just to mumble as you go back and people think you're still teaching. But do you get my point? We're all different. Diversity builds unity. If you don't get anything else out of this, well, there's a bunch you got to get. You got to get what we've said about the Spirit and His working. Diversity builds unity. So, verse 4 there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Pay attention to that, because number one, it's a spirit working in us, but there's all kinds of different gifts, and God has given us all kinds of different gifts, and he's gifted different people with different gifts and different ways, and we're gonna talk about that, but hey, there's a, there's a lot of different gifts. The gifts are listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're listed in, there's some listed in Romans chapter 12. We're gonna talk about why I think they're kind of different in some ways, but they're still gifts. They're listed and they're, they're given to us and pay attention to this, they're gifts. What is a gift? Something that someone gives you. A gift is not something you earn it's not something you figure out. It's not something you learn. You can't go to the Bethel School of Supernatural Works and learn how to be spiritual. Sorry. The Spirit works in you to be spiritual. So, listen, so you got 1 Corinthians 12, you got Romans chapter 12, and then 
You've got Ephesians chapter 4 most, mostly talks about gifts he's given to the church, and it's talking about offices he's given to the church and, and what he's given to the church. And then my favorite is 1 Peter chapter 4, like all of the lists, and so you have lists given. And here's the thing, I don't think these lists are complete. I think there's gifts that aren't even mentioned, that, and it's kind of implied that way. So I, th- I think that's important. But I love, here's what Peter says. Here's the gifts of the Spirit. Some are speaking gifts and some are doing gifts. And that's it. He only has two and he just gives us categories. I love, that's Peter, right? Peter just cuts to the chase on everything. So remember that. We have these lists given different places, but there's diversity, there's differences. Not everybody is going to get the same gift. We're all gonna be given different gifts. And especially here in Corinthians, I think he's talking about the manifestation of the Spirit, but I think, again, I think we need to understand that I'm gonna be gifted a certain way, you're gonna be gifted a certain way. And just because we don't approach something from the same viewpoint because of our giftedness doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. It means we're being used in the area where God has empowered us to move everything forward because we all need each other. I think it was John Calvin that said, and I know a lot of people freak out if you bring up John Calvin. It's okay, take a breath. You know you're gonna see him in heaven, just letting you know. So, but I think it was John Calvin said, why did God not give one person all the gifts? Because if he did that, we wouldn't need each other. We need each other. We need each other to be the body of Christ. And because somebody, somebody's gifted, I think this is a personal observation. I've watched people, especially people who have the gift of mercy, they think everybody else in the church is kind of hard and a jerk and doesn't see things right. I'm thinking, those people, sometimes they drive me crazy. Understand, you have the gift of mercy, but maybe mercy's not needed right now. Maybe something else is needed, and we need to move forward. Praise God we all don't have the gift of mercy, or we'd just be a bunch of blobs sitting around, I think. <laughs> right? We need each other. So there's a diversity. Underline that. Oh, and then underline, here's what I love. He says there's a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. Right? Now check out verse 5. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Oh, notice what Paul's doing. He's building something here to freak us out a little bit. So you have have different gifts, but you have people who have the same gift who are going to exercise that and minister, serve, right? That's what minister means. Serve that gift in a different way. We're not all going to do the same thing with the same gift. Are you with me? Because that's important to understand. I have the gift of teaching. But not everybody who has the gift of teaching is going to teach from a pulpit. Some people have the gift of teaching, they're gonna teach in a college. Some people have the gift of teaching, they're gonna do a small group. Some people who have the gift of teaching are gonna do some one-on-one stuff. Some, even some, are gonna serve in kids' ministry. Just throwing that out there. Some are going to use their gift of teaching in VBS. But we need to understand it because once again, I think a lot of times we feel like if somebody's not doing what I'm doing, man, if you were a real Christian, if you were really serious about the Lord, here's what you would be doing. And I have to be a little bit honest here. I think the worst people for that I shouldn't say this. Our missionaries. I served with a bunch of missionaries. I was discipled by missionaries. And most missionaries believe that if you are not out on the field doing missionary work, you're kind of like second class. And they need to understand, they need us as much as we need them. And we need each other. But, hey, that doesn't mean I don't want you to get mad at anybody. I don't want you to write any letters. The missionaries we support would never think that as they come and visit. Don't be, don't be like 
you know, hound dogging them when they come. Hey, uh, what do you believe in this? But I see that a lot. But I also see other people do that. I see people serving in certain ways. Hey, some people, they'll serve, you know, maybe they'll serve in the, in the usher ministry and they'd say, well, you're not serving. Man, I seat you every week and I don't see you doing nothing. <laughs> Watch out, right? Watch out. <clears throat> Number one, you're not the Holy Spirit, nor are you, in verse five, the Lord. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit gifts us with different gifts, and the Lord uses us in those giftedness, in that giftedness, in different ways. And so don't be judging people. Don't be someone who you think, man, I'm gonna get on this person because they're not doing it the way I do it. And here's what we know, I do everything right. Don't get in that attitude and don't start thinking about that. So, okay, so here's one more. And then he says this in verse five. There are differences, uh, I'm sorry, in verse six. There are, dif- or there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works, in all, or works all in all. Did you notice something? Verse four, the spirit. Verse five, the Lord. Verse six, God. Hmm. Sounds like the whole Trinity is busy trying to get us to do what we're supposed to be doing. Right? He's busy in our lives. And here he's saying, hey, we may have this, but we're going to have different activities. We're going to do it differently. I have a style of teaching because I'm me. You may come up and teach, and you're not going to have the same style. doesn't mean you're wrong, you're wrong and I'm right. We're different. And I think it's important to understand that. And that's why it bothers me so much when I watch, especially younger people, trying to develop the gift that God has given them. And they start watching somebody and they start trying to be that person. Man, if God wanted to make clones, he would just clone that person but he wants your activity to be different. He wants it to be you. Here's what I found in my life. I'm the best me I can be. Because nobody can be me like I can be me. You can try. Some people, some people mimic. There was somebody, there was a girl in Australia who did me pretty well, but she still wasn't me. Be you. God made you. God designed you, God gifted you, and God has a plan for you. Yield to him, allow him to develop that. And understand, we're not all gonna be the same, hallelujah. But we need unity. And we, if, we're not, listen, if we're not going in the same direction, we are going to get messed up. I was listening to an interview today about somebody, and I don't want to bring up the whole interview, but it was interesting because this person was defending people's right to disagree with him. And I thought that was good. You see, because we need to be people, we're not afraid for somebody to disagree with us. Most people who are paranoid about people disagreeing with them are so insecure. Like, I know what I believe, and here's the thing, I know who I am. And I'm very comfortable with who I am. Oh, I want to change, and I want to grow, and I want to understand God more, but I'm pretty comfortable with me, just as my personality and stuff. It's kind of too late to change anyway. But listen, listen, we have to be that person, and then people can come and disagree with you, and you can say, okay, well, that's your opinion. But I have my opinion, or I may have facts, and you may not. And I loved it because someone was disagreeing with him and he goes, okay, but you don't have the facts. And he asked the guy for a fact and he couldn't give him a fact. It was just a great, it was a great interview thing that the interviewer got interviewed by the interviewee. (laughs) It was fun. It was fun to watch. So we need to understand there's differences and differences aren't bad. I believe, listen, I believe people who have the most broad-minded, let's say, in their mind, liberal view, and I don't mean to just pick on that, but they have this great liberal view. We accept everybody. Really? You really accept everybody? What about when I don't agree with you? Well, I don't like you anymore. 
Eh, you don't accept everybody, do you? And we need to be people, church, that we're willing to accept different views and not get angry and not start name calling. But it's okay. Not everybody's gonna, do you, do you understand? In our world, not everybody's gonna agree with us. Go out and share the gospel. You'll find out, right? People aren't gonna agree with us. So Paul lays that out. Why, did, why was he so, I think, so meticulous in starting this whole topic of, and we're gonna talk about gifts. Why? Because it's so controversial. It was for them, and it is for us. Oh, and then verse seven, and we're gonna stop at verse seven. I know it's in the middle of a sentence, but it's okay. He says, verse seven, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. So here's what he said, the manifestation. Understand that. The Spirit manifesting himself in us. That's what he's talking about, right? Because I think it's important we understand that. The Holy Spirit will go into manifest, show himself through us. That's going to happen. He says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to some what does he say to each one? All of us. Don't be judging. He's given to each one. Why? For the profit of all. He didn't give us this manifestation of the Spirit so we could be cool. The Spirit doesn't manifest himself in us so we can have little trophies and say cool things. When and here's what I found in my life. When the Spirit is really manifesting himself in me, it profits everybody around me. Yes, Not just me. Everybody is profited. And that's what Paul is talking about. And even though I don't do it like everybody else, still people are profited by him manifesting himself in me. It's for the profit of all. Again, it's not, it's not, listen, it's not trophies, not toys, tools. Tools to build the body of Christ. Tools to reach out into the world. So, I want to stop here because we're going to kind of develop this and we're going to talk more about the manifestation of the Spirit, who He is, and we're going to talk about these lists that we went over and, and things we talked about. But I think it's important we understand the Holy Spirit is alive, yes, he is. he's working today, and don't be afraid. Just because there's abuses doesn't mean we shut it down. Grace is abused every single day in the churches in America. I'll never stop preaching grace, ever. Just because it's abused, I'm not gonna throw it away. I see abuses of the Holy Spirit, which, is, which I understand. It's understandable. Some of us, we see that, and we don't want anything to do with that. Well, praise God. I don't want you to get involved in abuses with the Holy Spirit. I want you to get involved with him. And it's okay to get involved with him. The abuses, let's stay away. So what does that tell us? Well, we're going to have to be some discerning people. And here's what it tells me. Don't be ignorant of spiritual things, be informed. Amen. And how do I get informed? YouTube. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> how do I get informed? The Word of God, right? Reading the Word of God. I just had to throw that out there. I wanted to see if you guys were listening. We get into His Word and we find out what does God say about the Holy Spirit? I don't, you know, and don't take this wrong. It's not important to me what Chuck Smith says. It's not important to me what John MacArthur says. It's not important to me what, John, what Chuck Swindoll says. It's not important to me what Michael Todd says. It's not important to me what Bill Johnson says. It's not important, and I could go on. What's important to me is what does God say? Yes. And I want to learn what God says. Now, there's some of those guys I listed I respect. Some I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. But some of them I respect. But I want to know what God says. And I want to understand what he says. And then here's the thing. I don't want to be ignorant. So I'm going to find out what God says. And it's not just in these, you know, three chapters. It's all through his Bible. 
But these three chapters are the stimulation so we start getting involved. Let's do that. Let's be a church who we're excited about the Holy Spirit's work in us and through us. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. And and Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to just look at it and, and Lord how we can read and understand. And Lord, I thank you that you're adamant about us not being misinformed or ignorant. But Lord, we want to be people who we know what you said, and then greater than that, we believe what you say. So I do pray that as we walk through this area of Scripture, that you would move in our lives. Some of us need to be set free. And we need to have a greater understanding and we need to be people who are more willing to accept what you want to do in in our lives and how you want to do it. Some of us, we need to be reined in and we need to be brought to that place where we're willing to allow you to control us. So I do pray that you would have your way, that we would grow and change and fall more in love with you But most of all, God, that we would move forward in all of the diversity we have here, that we would move forward in unity of glorifying our God and making you known to our world. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for another couple minutes. And maybe somebody invited you to church tonight. Maybe you just came on your own. Or maybe somebody drug you here. But you're here. And you heard us talking about the Spirit working in in, in people's lives. And maybe that even kind of intrigued you and drew you a little bit. But here's the important thing. You can never have the Spirit working in your life unless you're born again. The Bible says you must be born again. And what, what the Bible means by that is you have to come to the place where you're realizing that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and you're accepting that in your life. You recognize it. That's good, but you also need to accept it. And you need to let him know that you want to accept what he's done for you. So that all starts with this. You've got to let him know that you know you're a sinner. And then you've got to be somebody you're sorry for your sin. And you desire that relationship restored with God. Your sin has separated you You've offended him. And you have to be in that place tonight where, yes, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to know you. And if that's your heart, here's the good news. The Holy or, or Jesus came and died on the cross so you could have this relationship. All you have to do is let God know, yes, I'm ready. So if that's you tonight, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. You can say this prayer with me out loud or you can say it, quiet and silently in your heart but the most important thing it's got to be sincere it's got to be real you can't you can't just say these words like magic it's got to be a sincerity of your heart that you want your relationship restored with God if you're watching online you can say the prayer right where you're at you don't have to be here hey if you're backslidden man come home come back to Jesus tonight I know you walked in here and I know the Holy Spirit's working in you or you wouldn't even be here. So I just want to encourage you to take that step back with him and allow him to work in you. So if you want that reality, say this prayer with me. You can say it again silently or you can say it out loud. Jesus, tonight I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you tonight for your forgiveness. And right now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and guide me tonight. I want you to be my Lord 
and my Savior. 